you guys really set the bar high for all of us. This has been an extraordinary day. It's an honor to be back here. And it's also an honor to follow Emily's presentation. It really, as a person who spent 15 years in the federal government, it really is inspiring to see the government leading by example and really raising the bar very high. And I feel, um, as a former federal employee, almost embarrassed to follow that presentation. It's so extraordinary in its aspirations. Um, that was actually a photo I took from the Angelino Hotel Room the last time I was here. And um, what I wanted to do today is really, um, first just as a bit of background, uh, I spent 15 years with the federal government and I left because we weren't leading. And the, the thing that's a little different about landscape, a word that we haven't said very much today, is that in America, our two favorite hobbies are gardening and golf. And it became clear to me after spending 15 years and spending five years authoring the guidelines for the treatment of cultural landscapes and applying the Secretary of the Interior standards that we had it all wrong. That, you know, instead of sticks, we should be using carrots. Gardening is incredibly personal, as is golf. And what we really need to do is to teach people how to see and how to value landscape and landscape architecture in a way that people are hardwired to look at buildings. And so what I'd like to do today is, uh, is give kind of a windshield survey of um, documentation efforts in terms of our pioneers um, and our what's out there database. Second, looking at um, issues of designation. We just heard 600 properties, 20 landscapes, looking at what the parallels are in American designations. And then finally, looking at our role in advocacy and uh, education through conferences. Our mission, quite simply, is to partner with outside organizations and to teach people how to see and how to value landscape architecture and its practitioners. Um, I founded the organization 15 years ago. It was a volunteer gig for nine years um, while I had my day job with the feds. And we've had paid staff now for six years. Um, our website grew 150% last year in terms of traffic. We're looking at about 600,000 unique. And for the first time in 2013, our annual budget exceeded a million dollars. We present our mission and vision as if we're a cultural institution, like the ballet, like um, a theater company, we present a season of events. And what we're trying to do is be silo busters. We're not, in fact, if you go through our website, you will rarely see the word preservation. We try to avoid it. Um, in fact, um, we heard the word continuity several times today, and we talk very often about change and continuity. We have a new book series called Modern Landscapes Transition and Transformation, looking at how do we measure success. So let me begin first with our pioneers' efforts. They take the form of book publications. It takes about a decade to produce one of these books. There are about 150 to 60 pioneers in each volume. We span 250 years of design going back to colonial villages like Savannah, Georgia, and Oglethorpe up to present-day modernists like Larry Halpern that you see on the right. We're just now embarking on our third volume, and when this one is done, we will have chronicled over 500 pioneers with lengthy biographical profiles. I wanted to show this image because here are four Californians, and they've all passed away in the last decade. And what we've really seen in terms of landscape and, mo and modernism is a changing of the guard. Um, so for example, folks like Hideo Sasaki passed away in 2000. Um, we've been doing interviews with many of the senior partners in the successor firm. Uh, Ted Osmondson, the first um, modernist roof garden west of the Mississippi. Garrett Ekbo, um, most of these commissions are in Los Angeles, Pasadena and the um, Akatilla Lodge, which is here in um, Palm Springs. Ruth Shellhorn, the only woman on the Disneyland team who's been overshadowed by all the men in Walt Disney himself. Uh, the Oakland Museum of Art, uh, Geraldine Knight Scott working with Dan Kiley. Um, I, I'm going quick here because I knew a lot of these names for folks from outside of the US, it may not mean anything, although Herbert Bayer, of course, has an international reputation. But all of these people have been afforded biographical profiles um, through our pioneers' efforts. Ralph Stevens, who um, here is working with Richard Neutra at the Tremaine Garden. And then we're also looking at regional figures like Robert Deering, who really um, didn't publish. He is not well known, but built a number of significant regional um, gardens that we're trying to raise the visibility for. So these are both national and regional figures. The second component in our pioneers are our oral histories. We've completed eight of these to date. Six are in the US. Um, Cornelia Oberlander was completed about a year and a half ago. She's now still practicing um, on the eve of her 91st birthday. And uh, Shlomo Aronson is sort of the Olmstead of Israel, if you will. And we shot that oral history this past year. 
Um, all of these exist on our website, and I describe these as kind of like a Whitman's box of chocolates. It's a sampler. Um, the thought is no one's going to really sit down and watch a 90-minute documentary, so we parse it out under these three themes, biography, design, which is philosophy, and then we go with the landscape architect to visit projects where they often reflect on their legacy. In the case of Lawrence Halpers, Halperin, you see him with his wife Anna Halperin, the dancer at the Gropius Ball, an idealized portrait he painted of him and his wife Anna while they were students, and his um, influential mentor, Tommy Church. And then, of course, the projects. Uh, the Portland Chain of Open Spaces, which will likely be listed on the National Register any hour now, I'm happy to say. Freeway Park, the first park over a freeway globally, which should be a future NHL. Um, so what we're doing is we're getting to understand a person's career canon through these oral histories. Um, I mentioned Hideo Sasaki. This was Stu Dawson who worked with him. There's now three generations of Dawsons in the office, a son and nephew. Uh, Christian Science, which has been locally designated in Boston, which is a pretty big deal. And then um, on the top right-hand side is a landscape that's been significantly altered. This is Christopher Columbus Waterfront Park and one of the first in the modernist style in the US. The late Bob Royston, um, this was him on his 90th birthday on the top right. Um, this is a project that we've completed the shooting for and now we're trying to fundraise to um, finish the project. But to give you a sense of his work, um, here are some of his neighborhood parks which have an incredibly high degree of integrity. I would argue that uh, both Santa Clara and Bixby Park are future NHL candidates. They're just waiting for the thematic context. Royston has no landscapes listed on the register at this current time. His work at reservoirs, individual gardens, Santa Clara uh, Central Park, and the uh, reservoir. Now, what we try to do with the pioneers, and with it pretty much everything on the website, is everything is connected. So for example, you might begin to go and look at individual sites, individual pioneer entries, related events, and what's out there weekends. And that's what I'd like to talk about now in terms of how we're documenting and making landscape visible. First is what's out there. This is a project that was in development for about 10 years. Um, one of the things that's happened in the US, and I witnessed this during my time at the National Park Service, as landscape history was going like this, and we were seeing PhD level folks graduating from programs, we saw federal and state funds diminishing. So the state offices didn't have the expertise, and very often when a project would come up for consideration for designation, the essential context wasn't there. So what we decided to do is to begin to build that context. Over the course of a decade, working with um, dozens of scholars, we came up with a data dictionary. There are 27 landscape types, and there are 51 subtypes. So for example, parks go from large parks, which are over 500 acres, to neighborhood parks. So in essence, you can search by a type. So for example, here, you might look at plazas. It'll have a definition of that typology, very brief and accessible to the public. You could hit view all, and there might be pages and pages of plaza landscapes. You can also search by an individual site. Here's Dan Kiley's Art Institute of Chicago South Garden. You can begin to go into that a little deeper. Each of these have anywhere from uh, five to 10 images that you can download. It's also tied to uh, USG, uh, excuse me, to GPS coordinates. Uh, one of the things that we're launching in April is the handheld where you'll hit a button and it will say what's nearby within 20 mile radius. But it is also a context making machine. If you are trying to understand Dan Kiley, who has a number of National Historic Landmark sites, you can begin to say, show me just the Kiley landscapes that are National Historic Landmarks, show me all of his designs, give me a longer biography, show me all of the Dan Kiley landscapes that are throughout the United States, show me only modern landscapes in Northern California. And so we're actually beginning state level initiatives. We now have partnerships in place in Texas and in Virginia with uh, a variety of landscape architecture programs. And we've just finished a three year project to document about 170 landscapes throughout the state of Maine, working with the state nonprofit and some other local partners. So um, what we're really beginning to do is create that essential context for these landscape types. In addition to the database, and the analogy I make here for those of you from the US, it's like room and board. You know, room and board began as an online shopping catalog, and then it moved into urban areas. And it's almost like we're doing the same with what's out there. So one of the things that we do now are what's out there weekends to bring the database to life. And we'll have free tours. Um, we'll do two of these a year. This year, we're in Philadelphia in May. We're in Los Angeles in October. And we're trying something a little different. We're going up to the Berkshires in September. And we'll have 
about 1,500 to 2,000 people that will go through these sites with expert guides. And unlike private gardens, these are public spaces that people move through every day and don't know the stories. So what we're doing is we're making the hand of the landscape architect, the historic narrative, visible to the public. Um, we'll have all sorts of partners with these. Uh, for example, here you see a Chagall with the Chicago Mosaic School for kids. We had trolleys for those neighborhood parks that were far flung from each other. Um, and in the case of the Art Institute Dan Kiley Commission, you see here uh, Joe Carr, who was the original landscape architect in Dan Kiley's office, not only taking us through this space, but he was also being filmed while we were doing that. So that was then recorded, and all of this gets uploaded. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about designation. There's about 1,000 buildings in the National Register Plus that are less than 50 years old. In the case of landscapes, it's a much smaller number. It's about, uh, there's about 60 NHLs, for example, in landscape architecture. And then if you begin to look at which of those are modern, it's an even smaller percentage. I wanted to show this. I took this shot um, when we went to the Eames House a couple of years ago. And when you go there tomorrow, you'll notice there's a big plaque that sits inside the house. It was designated in 2006. And the big aha moment for me when I went there a couple of years ago is every time you see this photographed, it's taken about this far away from the building. And what I was not prepared for was the site, the row of eucalyptus please, trees, the promontory, the nasturtiums, all of these features that define the integrity of setting for this place. When this was designated in 2006, the box for significance in landscape architecture was not checked. And this is where we were. And I think that what's so interesting is when you think about the inside-outside relationships in California modernism in these early designations, what you see, inter what, interestingly enough, Ruth Shellhorn, who I just mentioned with Disneyland, who had done all the Bullock's department stores, uh, the one on the top there at Fashion Square, which had its own park, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, these nominations have gone forward for the buildings without having significance in landscape. It's interesting when the um, Stewart's Pharmaceutical Plant, which is now being converted to a transportation hub, um, when this was designated, there were three pages in the nomination that talked about Tommy Church's landscape, but then I want, it went on to say, well, there are other more important church landscapes. So this is kind of where things were when I was at the federal government, and these landscapes were just staying below the radar. Even Lawrence Halpern's work at Sea Ranch, where he's been involved for 30 years, when you go to the condominium complex where he designed this courtyard, all of the architects are recognized, but Halpern is not. When we think about the, the um, comment earlier about the vulnerability of open space, Sea Ranch is a perfect example about where this is happening. There is an expansion plan for the complex which would actually eat up the signature meadow that was a central feature in Halpern's design. Now, that was kind of the tough love part of the nominations. What I'm happy to report is I do think that there's been a profound shift that is happening. And I think about this as a shared value system. Whether it's Philip Johnson's Glass House, the Miller Garden, or the Gropius House, in all three of these cases in the last decade, these nominations have included significance in landscape architecture. In the case of Kylie, what's been interesting to me is I truly think that it's publish or perish. That once we begin to write about these places, and we saw this with the Miller Garden, um, when Gary Hildebrand's 88-page monograph or half of the endnotes in that NHL theme study done in 2000, it really began to make a difference. Tommy Church was recognized at the GM Technical Center that same year in 2000. Um, and we see the same with Kylie at the Air Force Academy. So there is a tide that is turning. What is so exciting is that this year, in January of 2013, we've seen two living landscape architects whose seminal projects have been recognized during their lifetime. Now, this is a really big deal for here in the US. The first is PV Plaza, which is still facing an uncertain future, um, but it is now designated. It's the progenitor of the Park Plaza by Paul Friedberg. And happy 90th birthday to Richard Haig, whose Gasworks Park was also designated in January. And this was a site known for the innovative use of bioremuneration of the site, not to mention the integration of industrial architecture. So finally, what I'd like to uh, conclude with is looking at some of our advocacy efforts. And I should mention that PV Plaza is, we're currently in litigation with this project with the goal of hopefully ensuring its survival. And in the case of Gasworks Park here again, this began as a, what's called a landslide. Our landslide program is TCLF advocacy at work. 
Each year we create a thematic list of places, and again, we're teaching people how to see. Um, for two years, uh, the first year was in 2008, we partnered with the George Eastman Museum of International Photography and Film. Uh, photography was commissioned by the museum, it's now in their permanent collection. It was a website, it was a traveling signboard show, and a photography show. But in all of these cases, what we're doing is we're, we're teaching people how to see a place. So for example, the image that I show you here on the bottom, this was an 1860s landscape that had a 1960s edition that nobody liked there. And so the artist worked an ambrotype to unite the 100 year later overlay. I'm happy to report there's now been an approved master plan by this local community, and there's great support to rehab it. Um, I don't have to talk a lot about Boston City Hall, but it's a good thing the photography wasn't done in January. And then finally, the Miller Garden, which was then facing an uncertain future, which is now, of course, saved and it's owned by the Indianapolis Museum of Art, the photographer made it as if it was a secret garden through a keyhole, and we couldn't yet quite have access. So um, an example of the exhibition when it was in Rochester and then at the Eastman, excuse me, at the uh, Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, and then we also want to get this to the public for people who are not going to museums. So for that program, we partnered with Design Within Reach, and we had um, eight different chapters of the American Society of Landscape Architects across the country where these sites were, and they each purchased a set of signboards that then traveled in their states. So we would have launch parties at Design Within Reach, taking advantage of their robust e-lists, which in some cases were 30 to 50,000 people, and then it would travel to universities and local community centers, but they were then owned by the chapter. So both of these things happened on a parallel track. We have also been doing outdoor signboard exhibitions. Um, there were a couple of these that had modernist issues. This is our Every Tree Tells a Story, which is now going down to Oak Alley after closing this month at the, um, the US uh, National Arboretum. And then in addition, we monitor these places. So when something makes it on a landslide list, we then look at it in terms of it being at risk and whether or not it has been lost or saved. So just to give you a few examples, uh, this is Dan Kiley's uh, work in Tampa, Florida. And you can see um, original images on the left. This was it during its reconstruction and the foundation has been rebuilt. The vegetation has not been returned yet. Um, and again, just different examples. Uh, the, the one that I think is that we're all watching very closely, for example, this is Lawrence Halperin's on the bottom right, Heritage Park, which is where Halperin ironed out all of his ideas for the FDR Memorial in terms of a sequence of outdoor rooms. This is on the National Register, but the public can't go there. It's not deemed safe, and there's a chain link fence around it currently. So the city is working with um, getting the public back in there. Um, the Fresno uh, Fulton Mall, which is one of the oldest surviving outdoor pedestrian malls um, in the, in the uh, modernist style, and also one of the first places to have a public art program in the country that's not associated with a museum. Uh, this too is a, an at-risk design. And then the other example that I wanted to sort of point to in closing is if you have the original landscape architect engage them. Um, with the PV Plaza controversy, there were new designs put forward, and what we really wanted to do is show that you can have your cake and eat it too. So we looked at the current program, which was to have an outdoor screen, to have um, a cafe, and what Friedberg's office did for us pro bono is created a series of drawings so we can begin to sell the concept of rehabilitation to show that there can be change and continuity in a space such as this, and it's not an either or. Finally, um, the last piece of this, in addition to the website, are the conferences that we do. So for example, when we launched the last um, Pioneers book in 2009, over the course of the next two years, we did nine regional conferences throughout the US. And what was so interesting to me is we would go to places, for example, here on the bottom, like Atlanta, Georgia, and people would say, we don't have any modern heritage. And then suddenly, all these things would come to life. Um, so what's just been extraordinary to me is to see local communities, and in particular college um, students getting engaged through this process, through these regional conferences. Uh, we had one here in Los Angeles, for example, looking at post-war landscape architecture. And candidly, before we did this, I didn't realize how much continuity and contiguity there was downtown in terms of post-war um, designs. The last two images that I wanted to show, again, being sort of silo busters, is 
We've been very uh, conscientious in all of our conferences to invite people who are design leaders who, are not who don't consider themselves preservationists to be on these panels, to really begin to look at what the legacy means to them and how it might inspire them. We've had two um, conferences looking at what we call a second wave of modernism in landscape architecture. Um, the second one was held last year at MoMA. We had, it was the first time ever in MoMA's history that there were a dozen landscape architects on the stage there at one time. It was all of the leading designers from Corner and Van Valkenburg to Catherine Gustafson and others. And in each case, as part of establishing their own work, they looked at who were those people that came before them, who were the modernists that inspired them, and what role it played in terms of their own um, evolution of their own design ideology. And this has really helped us alliance build with the much greater design community. In closing, just an infomercial, um, because we have everyone's addresses, I'm going to now sign you up for our e-letters unless you come up to me afterwards and tell me not to. And then also just wanted to sort of put our flag in the ground that we're looking um, to work with folks here in Los Angeles um, for our follow-up conference on preserving um, postmodernism, which we think is ripe for reappraisal. And here in Southern California, there is a relationship between architecture and landscape that exists nowhere else in terms of the movement. Thank you very much. <laughs>